Have you got your drink and your popcorn? Have a seat. The show is about to begin. Time for an undiscovered country's look at aquatics. That's right. A special presentation here on Saturday. Now, I have footage from Marco Isidori dealing with the subject of which I want to talk about today. Since Marco has gone scuba diving in Lake Malawi, and he's a Malawian cichlid keeper from the Italian Cichlid Club, I'm sure that he would realize about the IUCN Red List. And one of my friends happened to have had this species a few years ago. He probably still does. He's from uh, the Kansas City Heart of Kansas City Club, I do believe, uh, down in that area of the United States, where the undiscovered country is. Well, right now, well, there is this fish from Lake Malawi, getting back on topic here, called the Blue Orchid Malonatera, and it is on the IUCN list. And it is through the IUCN that trade of animals that are in danger get into the hobby. And, uh, Many of them are fish, but you know it, it goes all the way up to uh, up to killer whales. Okay, Russia still sells killer whales, but in this particular case, we as pet keepers can keep this wonderful fish. The second species I'll talk about later. Enjoy. from the stone, so it's very interesting that it, this was a, a Lagardus type. Questo è un elongato, si è detto, si vede spesso nel lago il comportamento di pesci che fanno le tane sulla roccia, che nuotano praticamente con la pancia di... interesting a speaker well if you join your local clubs or join a society like the American Cichlid Association or in Marco's case the Italian Cichlid Association you get a chance to learn from speakers that basically go into nature and study the fish in nature and then talk about them in the aquarium. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
giving a talk about Pelvia Chromis, well, there have been scientific studies involved in how eggs are affected at a certain temperature and pH, and then they get into fry development of pH at, at a scientific level. There has been scientific study on this. However, my interest is more in the line of Oliver Lucchini's work in the blind Lampologus species that was in sacred news. Now, there's some really, really interesting fish in the Congo River, but they have got a whole different water parameter than the Rift Valley cichlids. So keep that in mind when you're wanting to breed fish, and I hope you enjoy this aspect of the program. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
another species that I was going to generally talk about is known as the blue dolphin cichlid in the aquarium trade. Now, back in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, was the beginning of the Lake Malawi, and it was called Lake Nyasa back then, trade into the hobby. Like, basically, there was some of the Imbunas, many of them have changed their names, like Melanochromus erratus. Well, I had those. I had Labiotrophius fulaborni, and I had a big group of big haps, but not this particular species. I had Nimbochromus justoni. Now, if I butchered the name, it's Latin, okay? Well, when it, it comes to the group of Malawian cichlids nowadays that are in the hot. There is so many interesting species of haplochromite cichlids. Like they all evolved from the same family of haplochromite. And there is some really, really interesting predatory haps out there. But do your research on the species of fish that you want to keep. The world are renowned for boasting about their monster catch, but one angler can prove he's not telling tall stories. Jeremy Wade has video of his giant piranha-like fish, complete with teeth the size of a great white shark. Ah, those teeth! That will just take lumps out of other fish, it will take lumps out of crocodiles even, and there are stories well documented of that taking lumps out of people. It didn't stop him catching it though, did it? All 50 kilograms worth. What a fresh water monster this thing is. The Goliath tiger fish is no beauty, but it eats people, so you wouldn't want to mess with it, and it's basically a giant piranha. Jeremy Wade spent 25 years trying to land one of these beasts. Fish. Look at that! The net, the net, the net! And it was tough. The fish nearly swam off with him down the river Congo. No, I would have settled for something half the size of this. Um, but when I saw it on the surface, I was, I was very excited, but I was also quite worried because you can't ignore those teeth. And, you know, I wanted to get the fish in in one piece, but also I wanted to keep myself in one piece as well. Well, yes, it would probably be the teeth that might put most people off and the fact that they're as big as a great white shark's. People who think that piranhas are scary, if they saw one of these things, I think their nightmares might be populated by a slightly different animal. And if you're thinking of heading to Africa to catch your own, Jeremy has one last piece of advice. There's not a particularly delicate way of putting this, but if you're a male swimmer without any clothes on, be very careful because they like to snack on the bits that dangle down underneath. Many aquarium hobbyists such as myself like watching shows such as River Monsters hosted by Jeremy Wade. However, not very many aquarists could think of keeping a Goliath tiger fish. You need an awfully big tank for that. So why not use a bigger tank or a small tank for a Congo River biotope. And there are very interesting species that inhabit the Congo River. After all, I do believe Avery Brooks, when he narrated the, the Jewels of the Rift, talking about Lake Tanganyika, he stated the cichlids ruled the lakes and the catfish ruled the rivers. So there must be some very interesting catfish species in the Congo River. 
However, there's also other species of fish. Elephant nose fish come to mind, and they would make a very interesting centerpiece fish in a Congo River biotope. What else could we add? Maybe the previous fish that I mentioned in the previous uh, video, where it's the blind lampologus. Or what about tetras? There are so many different fish that come from the Congo River. And this particular episodes and what it will be followed by in video presentations is the elephant nose fishes. What a diverse, interesting group of species that belong to that group of fish. Enjoy the presentation. This goes out to Nathan, Sand Creek Aquatics. Hi, I'm Saili. Welcome to the first episode of Zoology Show and Tell, straight from Swansea University's Zoology Museum. Today we are going to talk about the long-nosed elephant fish, which is also known as Peter's elephant fish. It, it's a, a native to uh, Congo river basins and Niger river basins, so basically it's native to uh, West and Central Africa. As its name suggests, you can see a long a trunk-like protrusion from its mouth. Uh, it's a part of its mouth which it uses to navigate and to feed and communicate with other uh, fish in the rivers. Uh, one of the striking features about this fish is also that it has electroreceptors on its body and it uses this weak electric field to navigate through turbid dark waters and also to find a mate and uh, sometimes to find food as well. Uh, sadly, these fish are really popular and are in high demand and are often treated badly because of the large uh, demand for them in aquariums. So this was all about the long-nosed elephant fish. Stay tuned for more of such videos from Swansea University's Zoology Museum and look forward for the second episode of Zoology Show and Tell. Thank you. I'm John Sullivan. I'm a curatorial affiliate um, at the Cornell University Museum of Vertebrates. I'm an ichthyologist. I study freshwater fishes, specialize in African freshwater fishes. I work on marmirid weekly electric fish and also on catfishes. I didn't know when I started grad school that I'd end up doing fishes. Essentially, I kind of shopped around in my first year in grad school. I found that the, um, the ichthyologists had the best parties and I kind of started hanging out with them and one thing led to another and I, I uh, became part of a, a lab that was 
that was an ichthyology lab. I studied the, the phylogenetics of freshwater fishes, trying to figure out the family tree of these groups. So how these species are interrelated, who's more closely related to whom, um, for the purposes of understanding their evolution, and also to uh, improve our classification system. Freshwater fishes are hugely important in, in Africa. So I think across the continent, about 20% of people's protein comes from fishes. And most of those are, are inland fisheries. And yet, uh, very little is known about the freshwater fish fauna of Africa, in particular the uh, Congo Basin. So there's still a, a, a lot to be done. There's no Peterson Guide to the Fishes of Africa. So I had a Fulbright research scholarship to go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to inventory the freshwater fishes there. And uh, before I applied for the Rubenstein Fellowship, it just occurred to me that EOL was going to be the perfect place for us to um, put all the photographs and data that we would be collecting on this project. I created two life desks. One I called Congo Fishes, and the other one is the Mormirity life desk. So I've been working with those two life desks. I still have a long way to go, but I'm still plugging away. So I mean, they're hugely useful to me and also to my colleagues who, who work on these fishes. The reason I was interested in doing it was because I wanted such a thing to exist for myself. So it's a place where type images, images of live fish, also images of their electric discharges. So I, I've recorded the signals and I put those up with the species information. And so I see the two life desks that I'm working on as a means to ensure that my colleagues in Africa you know, have available to them uh, what they need to, you know, to identify fish species. Essentially, having the life desks available makes my collaborations with my African colleagues much more efficient and more fruitful. I think you know, in, in many ways EOL was a good fit for me because photography has always been a big priority. There's a real uh, lack of good good photographs of many of these species, especially in a place like the Congo. I make those things priorities to get recordings of their signals and to get photographs of the fish. I created a uh, project page on Facebook, um, gave my project a name. I think that's kind of important. I call it the Upper Congo Fishes Project. Basically first kind of advertise that to my ichthyology friends and colleagues. And there are a lot of people on Facebook who I don't know but are interested in tropical fish. And word got out that, hey, this guy is posting photographs from the Congo of, of tropical fish. And so it got more and more new followers. So now I think it's, you know, it's over a thousand people are following my Facebook project page. So that's been a great way to get word out about my Rubenstein Fellowship and about EOL. Sometimes I had species that I photographed and I wasn't sure what it was. And I have um, some professional um, ichthyologists following my Facebook page and also some advanced hobbyists who often know more about the species than I did. So um, it can be uh, quite useful. So I uh, wanted a, a logo for my project. And I had a friend uh, from college who was a graphic designer. She helped me out. And we created a logo, which you can see here on, on my coffee mug. I created an online store. That was a very useful way to sort of advertise what I was doing. So I didn't have a lot of people buying my stuff there. I, I, I was my own biggest customer, basically. But, I, uh, but you know, people who worked or who got involved with the project, you know, I'd give them a t-shirt. And so um, that, was a, that was a cherished gift for a lot of my African colleagues. And one nice thing about making a life desk page it's a, a short-term little project that you can just get done. So if you need to feel some sort of satisfaction that you've done something today that's concrete, you can you know, show somebody else, you can make a, make a life desk page. This is an excellent example of a, of a broader impact. You're gonna, it's, a, it's a great way to disseminate um, the data that you create in your research.